This is K.M. Wyland, and you are listening to the 423rd episode of the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. For a while now, I've had this idea that it might make an interesting post if I were to do a screen capture of my real-time writing process. Instead of just talking about what my process is while writing, I could make a video that would show people. So this week, I set up an external camera to show myself typing and did a screen cap of one of my writing sessions with my Portal Fantasy sequel, Dreambreaker. The first thing I have to note is that it was hard, much harder than I anticipated trying to write with the awareness that my real-time scribblings and meanderings were going to be read by others. The other thing I realized after re-watching the videos is that they were intolerably boring. Watching a novel's words appear on a screen in real time is far less fascinating than it is on the inside of the novelist's head where all the good stuff is happening. I was originally going to put a commentary over the video to explain my thought process in composing, but that turned out to be a lot of boring dead time too. So all this is to say that my original idea kind of went down the drain, but I still think the idea of writers sharing their real-time writing sessions is kind of interesting. If you guys agree, I may figure out some other way to share what I recorded at some future date. And now I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. First chapter checklist, part two, your opening scene. First chapters are complicated, which is why writers everywhere need a first chapter checklist. But even the checklists are complicated, which is why I've broken down our exploration of excellent first chapters into three parts. Last week, we talked about what is arguably your first chapter's most important job, hooking readers. But if you're going to provide readers with all kinds of juicy hooks in your opening line, opening situation, and characteristic moment, then you have to have a place to put them. Your story's opening scene is the box that holds all the goodies. In many ways, the opening scene is just like every other scene. Like any proper scene, the opening scene must fulfill basic principles of structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the opening scene is also special in many ways. It takes the normal duties of a normal scene and amplifies them into a microcosm of the entire story to come. This scene is chosen not just to advance the plot, but to introduce it. Learn how to ace each of these scene requirements and then add the special sauce that will make your first chapter strong enough and clear enough to launch the entire line of dominoes that forms your plot. And so this is first chapter checklist and number two, writing the opening scene. Tip number one, introduce the opening scene's main character. Story begins with character. The earlier you can introduce a character in your scene, and thus your book, the better your chances of hooking readers. It's true some stories, especially older ones, open with atmosphere that focuses more on physical and social settings or even theme. Thomas Hardy's classic Return of the Native spends its entire first chapter on scenery. But that requires a master's touch, a sure understanding of language, and the right genre to make this work as a successful hook for patient readers. Either way, you're going to have to introduce characters sooner or later. Aim for sooner. As the engine driving your story's conflict, your character is what makes the story move. Your opening scene has the added challenge of introducing a character whom your readers are meeting for the very first time. When you write your character's name on the first page, you must surround him with just the right amount of descriptive details. These include descriptive details to indicate gender, age, possibly occupation, and pertinent aspects of appearance and sometimes clothing, drama and or dialogue that brings personality to life and a sense of something missing or out of place in the character's life, either physically or spiritually, which we'll discuss more in the section on scene goal in a minute. You have the space of the entire scene to convey most of these details. Don't info dump in the beginning. Choose early sentences carefully to immediately give readers as full a sense of your character as possible without overwhelming them. And by the way, although your opening scene won't necessarily open with your protagonist, that's always the best route when possible. The first characters your readers meet will be the character to whom they will instinctively want to attach their loyalties. They want to meet your protagonist. So don't make them wait unduly. 
As I did last week, I'm going to continue using examples from the first chapter of my soon-to-be-published Superhero Historical Wayfarer, which opens with this initial introduction of my protagonist. In the hamlet of Afri, folk cherished the plague. Will Hardy was not one of those folk. In all truth, he held no belief whatever in a plague he'd never had sight of in all his life. That was why he ran, head up, arms pumping, directly towards the source of it. This names the character, shows him wanting something, although readers won't immediately know what it is, and moving toward it, as well as telling us something about Will's slightly cynical nature. Other details are sewn throughout the chapter. Will's age, she could not be more than eight and ten, no more than a year younger than he. A pertinent detail about Will's appearance, Will was no hawking lad, but this Dr. Silas undercut even him by at least a hand span and an indication of Will's occupation and station in the world. I'm a good worker. Anyone hereabouts will tell you. Ask my master at the forge, Tom Colville. Tip number two. Establish the main character's scene goal. Although we're discussing them separately here, character and goal should never be separate. The moment your character shows up on the scene, he should be in pursuit of something. He wants something. But he's not just sitting around wanting it. He's already up in motion pursuing it. There are three things to note here. Number one, the right way to understand in Medea's Rays. Opening with the chapter already in pursuit of a goal is the essence of how to open in Medea's Rays, in the middle of things, and to do it well. There's a common misconception that opening in Medea's Rays means opening in the middle of fireworks, battles, car chases, explosive arguments, etc. Nothing wrong with these openings, but forcing the action too early in the plot or too explosively, can sometimes make it difficult to include all the elements in the first chapter checklist. It's just as easy, sometimes easier, to hook readers with a small, pertinent character goal as it is an in-progress terrorist attack. Number two, the opening scene goal's relationship to the main plot goal. Your character's goal in this opening scene must be related to the main plot goal she will develop later on, but it almost certainly will not be the main plot goal. This is for the simple reason that the main plot goal will not entirely form until the protagonist fully encounters the main conflict as she enters the second act. In most stories, the protagonist won't even get her first full look at the main conflict and or goal until the call to adventure at the inciting event halfway through the first act, around the 12% mark. Instead, the goal in this opening scene will be set up for that call to adventure. What happens in this scene, however ancillary to the main conflict, will be the first domino pushing the character, probably unawares, toward that inciting event. This means the opening goal will be related to the main conflict, but not in a way the character is yet fully conscious of. And number three, opening with a sequel instead of a scene. In discussions of scene structure, I'm often asked whether a book can open with the reaction or sequel half of a scene in the aftermath of an off-screen scene disaster. The short answer is yes. In fact, opening with the character in full-on reaction mode to something earth-shattering can create an excellent hook, but the character must then immediately progress from reaction to a new goal. Don't open with the character sitting around thinking. Open with the character in action, pursuing something important. As we've seen, Wayfarer opens with the protagonist in literal action, running as fast as he can across the field. Readers understand immediately that he wants something. This provides a little space for me to wait until a few paragraphs later to reveal this something is a job. The doctor's eyes lit up. He grinned, revealing a full yellowed set of teeth. Now we come to it. Do you know why I asked you here? Will responded, your note suggested you'd pay the fare for a likely boy to transport something of value to London. Tip number three, establish or foreshadow the antagonistic force by a conflict. In any properly structured scene, the next step after establishing your character's goal is obstructing that goal with conflict. The character wants something, but getting that something isn't a straightforward proposition. Something or someone interferes causing the protagonist to fail in gaining her desire or gain her desire, but with consequences, 
or partially fail in gaining her desire, forcing her to formulate a new strategy. In your opening scene, this conflict should be even more faceted than usual. This conflict will introduce the main plot either by establishing or by foreshadowing the story's main antagonistic force. Now, wait a minute, you're probably thinking, but didn't you just say the opening scene doesn't introduce the main conflict because the protagonist hasn't even seen it yet? Too true. The important distinction here is that in the second act, the character's main goal will have met the main obstacle and antagonistic force creating the main conflict. Either the main goal or the main conflict or both will not yet be present in the story's beginning. But, and here's the important part, neither of these things come out of nowhere. They develop from seeds of motivation on both the protagonist's and antagonist's part and from causal circumstances. Your opening scene needs to present or at least foreshadow the first of these causal circumstances. Here's an easy rule of thumb to ask yourself when deciding if your opening scene's conflict is pertinent enough to the main conflict to come. If you remove the goal slash conflict of this opening scene, would the protagonist still find his main goal or be able to meet the antagonist in the second act? If the answer is no, then the opening scene's current conflict is likely too ancillary. Even if you choose to open with a segment that is essentially a self-contained episode, as is currently popular in many action movies, that opening episode still needs to plant seeds for the conflict to come. In my opening scene, Will wants the strange Dr. Silas to hire him to take something to London. That's his goal. But Dr. Silas proves unreliable, and after Will loses his temper, refuses to hire him. Mortified to realize a London gentleman witnessed the exchange, Will is then intrigued when that man offers him a new opportunity for finding his way to the city. This opening goal, Will wants to go to London, and opening conflict, Will doesn't get along with his potential employer, are not the main goal and conflict Will will encounter in the second act. But they are directly pertinent to setting up first the call to adventure at the inciting event, in which Dr. Silas is directly involved in Will's gaining super speed, in Will's eventual sojourn in London, and in Will's primary plot struggle of protecting his master from the antagonist. Just as importantly, this scene's disaster is what forces Will to take specific actions in the following chapters, completing the necessary setup in the first act. Tip number four, introduce other important characters. Many scenes in your story will introduce new characters but none will introduce them with more power than your first chapter. The number of characters you're able to introduce in this opening scene will depend greatly on the choreography of the scene itself. Here are a few rules. Rule number one, don't overload characters. Don't feel as if you need to introduce all the characters right away. It's better to focus on a few in the first chapter and then so in the rest later on. Particularly for characters who are important to the story, you will want to give yourself the time and space to introduce and develop them properly. This may mean saving certain character introductions for the second or third chapters or even later. Rule number two, try to include at least one supporting character. The most interesting opening situations are almost always those in which your protagonist is interacting with another character, preferably in dialogue. As arguably the only true form of showing in a story, dialogue is one of the most engaging ways to grab readers and disseminate information, preferably more by implication than outright explanation. I think it was writing instructor Nancy Kress who observed that her books didn't start selling until she started putting dialogue on the first page. Rule number three, remember that early characters are the most important. Here's another rule of thumb. The earlier an element, a character, setting, theme, plot device, etc., is introduced in the story, the more importance readers will attach to it. In short, your opening chapters should be reserved for your most important characters. This is not the time to introduce arbitrary elements that will never again be mentioned. In itself, this is yet another reason why it's best to open with your protagonist where possible. But don't stop there open with her most important relationship, or at least the most important relationship currently available within the story. 
For example, Wayfarer's opening chapter introduces the protagonist, his love interest, his primary antagonist, and a crucial catalyst character. Almost right from the beginning, Will has someone to talk to. And the introductory information is largely disseminated via dialogue and much of it by implication through the conflict of that dialogue. Other important characters are introduced at the earliest possible moment in subsequent chapters. Tip number five, ground the setting, place, time, season, and weather. As in any scene, it's important to ground readers in the setting. They need to have a visual sense of the physical space in which the character finds himself. As always, the importance of these details is magnified in the opening chapter. Not only are you introducing details of the scene, you are also introducing details of the story itself. So where is the story taking place? Where are the characters oriented within the setting? When is the story taking place? The year, season, month, even that day and hour. And what's the weather? As with character details, much of this information doesn't need to be shared immediately. It can be disseminated throughout the scene, but readers need to be grounded with at least a few of these pertinent facts right away. Now, in Wayfair, I cheat a bit by opening chapter one with the informative header, Northern Surrey, September, 1820. I then follow up with an informative paragraph that further emphasizes the season, the physical locale, and the weather. After last month's barley harvest, the fields lay in barren contentment, even with his feet flinging soil clods. The sun burnt through the crisp autumn breeze and heated his face. He was belated, and considering what awaited him, that was far worse than any fabled plague. Your opening scene is make-or-break territory for your book. Not only will it be a key factor in determining whether readers engage with your story, it will also plant the first stone in what will either be a strong foundation or a weak foundation for your entire plot to come. Make the right decisions about these five aspects of your opening scene and you won't have anything to worry about. Next week, we'll explore your first chapter checklist number three, how to set up theme and plot in your first chapter. Thank you for listening to the Wordplay Podcast. To read a transcript of this episode, you can visit my website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And be sure to check back again next week.